Uh, once upon a time, there was um, a young scientist who came back to New Zealand and wanted to work on agriculture and thought, hmm, what am I going to work on? And I'd worked on climate change and said, well, I'm going to work on dry land pastures. And I was mentored by Dick Lucas, and I feel a wee bit of a fraud here today because Dick actually did the mentoring of these two um, very much in, in their process of their journey on subclover. So I'm going to try and fill in a little bit of the background as to why we might be interested in subclover, but actually just legumes in general. Um, and I'll concentrate on the subclover as, as I go through it. Uh, the very I want to take science from the science to the application, which is what David and Joel take us through. The very first experiment, or one of the very simplest ones I did, was um, a lot of land being converted on the Canterbury Plains from dry land to dairy farms. So what actually happens when we um, look at that? And, and so this experiment had um, some very simple treatments. It had nothing added to it, or it had nitrogen added to it, or it had just water added to it, or it had nitrogen and water added to it. And I've used this in teaching for uh, the last 15 years, but it illustrates some really strong points about what makes plants grow. So if we take our typical Canterbury dryland pasture before we actually do anything to it, we grow about 6.3 tonnes of dry matter. We spend $10,000 a hectare and buy a centre pivot irrigator, and we get about 10 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. And that's pretty much what happened when the um, plains were irrigated initially. People went, OK, I've bought this irrigator, but I'm not really growing a whole lot more feed. Because the main limitation is actually nitrogen. And that green line illustrates that dry land pasture from 6.3 tonnes with just nitrogen added. So we haven't added any water here. That's just nitrogen. We've gone from 6.3 to 15 tonnes of dry matter. That shows us the potential of where our dry land is at. Now what the dairy farmers have done um, is recognise that they weren't getting a whole lot out of their water and that actually the main limitation they had was nitrogen as well. And when they add that nitrogen then they can get 22 tonnes of dry matter. And if we look at that and you just work out some very simple maths, 22 tonnes of dry matter requires about 3.5% nitrogen. 3.5% nitrogen means that that actually requires about 700 kilos of N to be able to do that. Now that's not all applied. That's coming from mineralisation in the soil. It's coming from returns from the animal. But it illustrates that nitrogen is our deficiency when we're growing plants. Now that's not unique to New Zealand. That is the world over. The introduction of the Haber-Bosch process allowed us to go from about 1.8 billion people to 7.5 billion people. That's called the Green Revolution and it was the production of urea that did it. If we look at that graph and we look at the blue line at the top, it's sort of squiggly. The only reason it's squiggly, because it's got unlimited water and unlimited nitrogen, it's squiggly because of the temperature. So if we account for temperature, we can actually come up with some straight lines. And in this case, the 9.8 tonnes is the no nitrogen, but plenty of water, and the 22 tonnes here is the, the nitrogen and water treatment. So we're growing about seven kilos of dry matter per hectare per temperature unit that we accumulate because plants actually need temperature to be able to grow. So that's the basis that we're working with and there's a gap there and that gap has been filled by the introduction and the production of um, urea fertiliser. And that is a very energy intensive process producing urea. It takes a lot of greenhouse gases to do it. It's a very inefficient process. We don't actually account for it because most of it's done overseas, so we don't put that in our greenhouse gas equation and say, look at the, the cost of doing that. But from a sheep and beef perspective, we either have, we have the same drivers. We either have to deal with the nitrogen from urea or we have to find another source. And so our work has been trying to find that other source, and that other source has been legumes. And, and I note this diagram is in um, the handout, one of the booklets that you've got able to be picked up if you want to. And it, it illustrates the problem that we have, that if we want to grow high quality pastures and have animals that are growing above 300 grams per head per day, we have to be feeding an ME of 12. And that is mostly clover, good quality lucerne, swedes, turnips, ewe milk. Those are the things that we have to be using. And if we're in a dryland situation that David and Joe are in, we actually have to do that within about 100 days because that's the only period that we have to be able to grow animals. We have to grow 300 grams per head per day pre-weaning to be able to get animals up to weight, or we have a whole lot of store lambs we've got to try and get rid of. So that's the situation, the scenario that faces us from first principles. So the pastures we've tried to focus on are utilising a limited water supply, um, 
Ni knowing that nitrogen is what makes plants grow, we've got to meet the animal demand and the plants that do that in early lactation are the most useful to us because that's when our demand is highest on sheep and beef properties. They've got to be productive, profitable, socially acceptable and for me that means they're legume dominant. So that's the basis for the work that we've done at Lincoln. The next set of questions we tried to ask was, well, which pastures should we actually be growing if that's what we're trying to achieve? So the next experiment that Beef and Lamb helped us with um, was based around grazing of ryegrass, white clover, lucerne, coxfoot sub, coxfoot balanza, coxfoot caucasian and coxfoot white. And, and in summary of that data, the line at the top is the lucerne, it's the best option, and therefore the early part of my scientific career was spent getting lucerne out onto properties and trying to understand it, and so people recognise generally that's the work that I've done. But the second best pasture that we had in that system for nine years was coxfoot with subterranean clover. And so our research focus has now moved into trying to move sub clover. We've, we've done quite a bit on lucerne, um, there's a lot of information out there if you want it. But now we're moving and saying, well, can we complement that with subclover? So that's the work that we're trying to do. That's the science. Um, Dick Lucas just said we're going to do it and got out and did it about 10 years ago. So that's pretty much how David and, and, and Joe's system got going. Why sub? Because it grows earliest in spring. It's an annual clover. It's our earliest growing legume in the spring. So it has an annual life cycle germinates in the autumn, grows a little bit through the winter. As the spring starts to warm up, subclover kicks into gear. So it's giving us legume three to four weeks earlier than our white clover grows, and it's giving us more legume. And there's a lot of different cultivars out there that might have a different profile. But in essence, it's not going to grow through the summer, but it is going to give us that early spring production, and that's why we're interested in subterranean clover. So moving from that very small plot experiment, we then went to Ashley Dean. Um, some of you may have heard of P21 funding, so some of your P21 funding from your levies went to our Max Annuals experiment, and we were trying to work out what would happen if we add Coxfoot and Sub, or we add uh, Ryegrass and Sub, and a couple of other annual clovers, and can we actually achieve this 300 grams per head per day that we need to? Now this is Ashley Dean. Um, for those of you that don't know, it's about the poorest soil you could possibly have, so it's a great place for a Lincoln University farm. If we can do it at Ashley Dean, we can pretty much do it anywhere. It's, it's um, the equivalent of a hillside without being a hill, because it allows us to establish the plots. So we ended up with the ryegrass dying, the little bit of plantain that we had in those pastures survived quite well, and in spring it looks a picture, and that's when we take the students down there and get them to do their plant identification. And they can find subclover dominant pastures that look like this. And when I mean subclover dominant, that's what I mean by subclover dominant. They are 70 to 80 percent subclover in those pastures. Because by November, it can look like that. And you know, this was an exceptional year, 2015 spring. I'm sure the people from North Canterbury remember that one quite well. Um, but that's what we're dealing with. So it's a very short window of opportunity that we have. So we've got to be able to grow lambs from a five kilo birth weight, say, to 35 kgs in 100 days. That's 300 grams per head per day. And that's what we achieved. In all of the years that we, we did this experiment, we actually achieved that. And so here's the 300 grams per head per day. Um, and yes, we achieved that in all of those years. Now, the ewes, depending on whether it was a good season or not, the ewes either put on weight or in the last season here, they lost. So it's very hard not to achieve that 300 grams per head per day. The ewes have actually taken it off. But in good years, we managed to maintain um, the ewe live weight and actually keep the condition on them as well. So yes, we've been able to do that on farm. The stocking rates here, um, I've got and we've got the, the kilos per hectare. So within that three month window, we're actually producing about 500 kilos of live weight per hectare off these pastures, off the boniest soils that, that you've got around. Um, you come into the January period and we get a little bit of rain and the sub clover is enjoying that bare ground and that's where it's going to come back from. The first year we allowed it to set up some seed and then grow from there. Sub clover is a big seed, so we use a higher sowing rate than we do with white clover. I said it's a winter annual, so it handles that, those cooler temperatures. It actually doesn't like being sown in the middle of January, it's too hot. It prefers it when it's sort of 11 degrees or below, that's when it's actually starting to grow. So you see your barley grass starting to kick off, that's about the time sub clover quite likes to grow. 
You get rapid but variable germination, and what we're trying to do is build up a seed bank of seeds in, in the first year that we operate. And I'm going to let David and Joe explain how they've done that on their property more than me. Um, but it's crucial to know when those seedlings can be grazed in the autumn. That's the key management strategy. If we go and eat them too early, then the sheep will target them and they disappear out of the system. So they need to have um, some, some being looked after a little bit in that early autumn period, but after that they're quite robust and will grow quite well. Um, and David will take you through a little bit about how he maximises seed seed as well. The subclover actually pulls itself down when it first germinates. This, the growing points are all above ground and if you put animals in here, they'll nip that off and there's no growing points below ground so it can't actually recover. So we've got to wait till it's pulled itself down and anchored itself into the ground before we can start that grazing in that, that autumn period. And so we're looking for about um, three or four leaves on that plant before it's anchored itself and can handle being grazed. It's a hairy legume, not all as hairy as this, but compared with white clover, there's little hairs on it. So if you don't know if you've got any on your property, you can go and look for a hairy clover. There's a couple of them out there, but subclover is likely to be one of them. And it's self-fertile, so it doesn't need the bees. Um, this is the flower and that flower is self-fertile. That flower then turns under the ground, anchors itself with that anchor point there and produces the seeds that are buried under the ground. Subterranean clover, under the ground clover. Sub, under, terrain, the ground. So that's what it's doing. And we're trying to turn 10 kilos of seed that we might sow into 500 kilos or a tonne of seed in the ground that's our seed bank ongoing to work with from there. We can drill it before rain and, and so in the last autumn when I was in North Canterbury I was advising um, some of the farmers up there in February just go out and drill some sub clover into your pastures. I know it's dry but at some point it will rain and we know that because we actually did that with an experiment, did it in March 2015 um, and it didn't rain till June but the sub clover popped up when it rained in June so it actually survived quite well that, that drilling but it meant that it was there and in the ground and that they were just trying to thicken up the pastures and get some legume into those pastures. Um, high strikes, so in the first year we get that, but high strikes after we've had a drought. So a lot of you will have seen sub clover come up in your pastures this year if you've been through a drought period. It, it really enjoys that. January can be a bit troublesome if we get false strikes. We don't like that and I think Joel, David will pick up on that. It sort of feels like you're, you're killing the animals or killing the plants because they die, but that's just how it is. You haven't killed all of them. Um, but the amount of cover in autumn is really crucial to the success of subclover. And so tag like this is, w is the biggest enemy of subterranean clover. So you need to get rid of that and David will take you through how they do that in Marlborough and I'll take you through how we do that in Canterbury. Or how we did it this last autumn anyway. <coughs> um, that's the Port Hills. And the first thing that came back after burning on the Port Hills was the Californian thistles because they've got underground rhizomes, so the top all burnt off, but they've got this underground store and they came back beautifully from that. And the next plants that came back were the twitch or the cooch because it also has an underground rhizome and it loved it. But the other plant that really came up a lot was subterranean clover, that really hot, hundreds of degrees centigrade intense heat cracked all of the seed that was in the ground that never saw the light of day because it's on a peri-urban environment that doesn't get grazed very well, those seeds were sitting in the ground and they have come up and they have struck and produced huge banks of subterranean clover in amongst these pastures. These farmers um, in this lo these lifestyle areas have really not seen subterranean clover coming up like that. So that's the ecology of what's happened to that plant. So it's there and it's got the potential, it's telling these people in this environment that if they manage it properly it is there and it can grow. Um, lots of production from it and because we got a very early break and, and I mean it just rained beautifully for it then you can expect that we can grow six or seven tonnes of feed by early September on those pastures. That's the sort of production that we can get off it from a pure sub clover stand. So I'm going to, there's a whole lot of new subclovers around, some large leafed ones, and that's um, the, the target of one of our projects at the moment, Sub for Spring, so we're working with Beef and Lamb and um, the Sustainable Farming Fund on that program. And I'm just going to conclude by highlighting the points that underpin the processes that David and Joe have picked up on. So legumes provide nitrogen for water use efficiency. I think it's a more sustainable, socially acceptable system for us to be trying to manage our legume input. That's the way I would like to see us 
co concentrating on our pastoral systems. Um, if you can, you do lucerne or perennials first. It's better to have your perennials operating on your flat land and wherever you can, and then we move on to the, the annuals. If you can't do that, then um, you've got to do the annuals, and that's the situation that these guys were in when I was talking to Doug Avery about a lucerne system. Um, Doug's now moved into some subclover as well, but his first option was to deal with the flat land in the areas that he could get the most benefit out of. Um, subclover is often dormant in pastures. It's sitting there, as I showed you, from the hills, and it's, it's got a seed bank there. We just need to know how to manage it. So the question I t try and put to farmers is, which legume drives your system? And the answer is for David to give. For him, it's sub. So that's it from me. Well, thank you everybody for the opportunity from beef and lamb. Um, I'm sure if I press the right button, I'd rather see Peter Burling in the ticket parade in Auckland. <laughs> but uh, we're stuck with sub for the afternoon. Sub was first introduced in the 1920s, which is pretty much the same age as the old Dick Lucas over there. He's been the guru of it. So much of New Zealand's summer eastern dry country actually has sub. Today's talk is really how we produce bulk feed over the winter and that carries us into the spring. I want to outline just briefly our overall farm system, what the old system before was like, the development, the development we did, and the new management system. Then I'll cover how we enhance the subclover population in a different block each year, um, the recipe for it, and then Joe will talk about the production and the financial benefits, and then hopefully we'll finish with the um, question and answer session. That's what we aim for. That's twinning ewes, 1st of September, on fantastic quality feed. Um, our lambing date is around the last week in August, 1st of September, and when those lambs hit the ground, they're running. Um, we, we hope to have them off the property between 9 and 10 weeks of age at 17.5 to 18 kgs carcass weight. And we have to do that, like you guys in North Canterbury and Marlborough, because as you well know, by the time November, late November hits, we've gone, we've gone brown, and that's it. Um, just a wee bit about the property. We're southwest of Blenheim, about 15 kilometres. Um, rolling country to steep hill. We have 0.06% of the farm is flat, and that's now in vineyard. And that was re a real catalyst for getting this project underway. Um, back in the early 70s, my father, Tony, he um, loaded up a Dakota from Woodburn with superphosphate, three kilograms of Wurgenallop sub, a kilogram of Mount Barker and something called Apanui Coxfit, which some of you guys might have, which is hideous stuff because it goes all clumpy and horrible. And we were strapped in this thing, flew up from Woodburn out into Cook Strait, about five or 6,000 feet up, so we could come back over the property and somewhere where we thought our farm was, the pilot opened the chute and all the super and clover went everywhere. But it worked. It um, got established. The, roughly the mix was around three pounds of sub, eight pounds of Apanui Coxfit and eight of rye. I'm not quite sure what cultivar that ryegrass was. Just a quick rough boundaries of the property. Um, it's 22 kilometres from the, um, <coughs> oh, I think I can get that to go, from that point down to there. That's the Arachi Valley side. That's the Wairau Valley side. So it strands the two ranges between the Wairau and the Arachi Valley plains. Um, the area outlined in yellow is where we've been focusing on the subclover enhancement. In the middle there is um, a biodiversity area, which is 3,000 acres of Manuka Kanuka regenerating very quickly into um, native green species, which is actually a very special part of the property. And right on the so southern corner, very close to the Aotu River, down here is 500 hectares of really, really productive country, which has gone through a um, spray and prey burning regime and is really paying huge dividends. Um, oh, it's that one there. Yep. Okay, she's running 10,000 stock units at the moment. Um, you can see the breakdown there of, of the stock classes. We have a very high cattle sheep ratio on the property for good reason, and that is, gives us flexibility. Dry autumns, calves go, we can carry everything else through uh, capital stock through the winter, and dry autumns is not actually uncommon at home. Also gives us plenty of teeth to control that grass to keep that clover coming through. And also the other big plus is the parasite management. 
that there's a quick shot of the back country, and that's um, under, the, under the moment is under quite a biodiversity project, and also carbon production. Um, there's 300 hectares just in there, which has been registered uh, under the carbon credit program. Just a quick shot of the back country, uh, the southern part of the property, next to the Archie Valley River. That's gone through the spray burn and over so, but that, that's another story, but it's been very, very successful out in that, that country. That's the Wairau Valley side in a typical summer, which is not uncommon to you guys either, but that's um, what we're faced with um, most summers, late summers, early autumn. So now I'll take you through the old system and then the development we did and the changes from it. It required transforming pastures, stock policy change and management and a real big attitude change. In the old way, 96, 97, which was the year Joe and I took over, um, right prior to the uh, first drought we struck, we were running 12,000 stock units and we were down to 3,000 stock units within 18 months and we had eight inches of rain in, in 18 months. So it, it was actually tough going. We had very large blocks, spring grass far too long when we had this small spring, slow growing lambs, very poor ewe weaning weights, very vulnerable to drought, dams, creeks gone. The clover was over sown, as I said, in the 70s, but it was swamped by this rough looking country. And before we move on to this, I've just got to briefly pause and thank Dick Lucas, Pete Anderson and Chris Mulvaney and the Monitor Farm program that we were involved with in the early 2000s, which got us out of jail. So in 2000, it all started. We ident that identified area that you saw on the map of 560 hectares was taken to 30 hectares from 100 hectares down to 9 to 18 hectares. Uh, and with an, an initial 30 kilometres of fencing, which is now 50 k's of fencing. And we invested 150 k in a water scheme with 60 odd uh, troughs. And then under the mon Monitor Farm and the Sheep for Profit program, we understood feed quality and just what use required. There was no over required from this uh, method. It was all there already. We just knew how to learn, had to learn how to manage it. We dropped use back added 100 cows and added the flexibility of, of being able to either have store calves or yearlings, but now we're in the position of finishing everything off the property. So to get to the nuts and the bolts of this, what we do in the spring is identify a block that is sadly lacking in sub with just scattered plants. In the late summer, we thump it with cows and calves, as bare as you can get it without hurting stock performance. So that's um, pre-grazing on the left and grazing on the right. It's not bare as it should be, but that is, is how you should have it um, by the time end of, Feb end of January, early March. So by February, we've got it to that situation, to that stage, and we hope for rain, which gives that initial, initial strike late February, early March. April's still okay to avoid false strike, but you need at least 20 mils to get it going. At this point, it is so important to leave it and get off it until that five trifoliate leaf stage, and this can take up to six weeks from germination. And the biggest single benefit is now we have quality feed for twinning ewes from after scanning, post scanning, which is now, to set stocking, which is the middle of June. So that's the seed germinating in um, March. So, so important to leave it alone and get right, keep right off it. That's how it should look in May, um, and you just watch it grow. And then you start the strip grazing um, post scanning, which is now. Great to have children about for that. Um, what you do to your ewes from this point in time through to set stocking absolutely is paramount for setting up lactation. If you underfeed now through poor lact, and you, you'll have poor lactation, when you set stock, it's totally irrecoverable. irrecoverable. So once ewes are set stocked for lambing, this chosen block is also again shut right up to December. And this creates a huge bulk of feed which is only grazable once those burrs are safely anchored in that ground. And you've got to keep checking it. You open it up and just, it's just the same old grass pull test, just give it a quiet tug. If it comes out, it's not ready. It's perfect timing for us for cows and calves with the bull out. By mid-December, we're looking for good quality feed. It may be snap dry feed, but it's high quality. There we go. 
This sort of feed will quite happily grow lambs at 450 grams a day. And as I said earlier, it is paramount to have stock unloaded before the summer dry sets in in late November. In our situation, we have gone from 50, maybe 45% prime off mum at weaning to 85% gone at 17 and a half to 18 kg carcass weight. And that's just made a, such a huge difference to the bottom line. They're only nine to 11 weeks of age, but they're thumping along. And the other huge advantage is being able to maintain use through that dry summer. Our weaning weight now almost equals our tupping weight, so we're on a level playing field all the way through. And in the old days before fencing and development, we were just chasing our tail, feeding heaps of baleage, trying to keep them up to weight for tupping. That's what the burr looks like once it's set, set, set down in the ground. And up to one tonne of seed per hectare can be set. Now what's sub clover a kilogram dick? 16k? So you get $16. So you can do the maths on that. For the rest of the system, Joanna's going to cover that. She's far more interesting to talk to than I am. So, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Just going to talk about the production and financial benefits that we've got from the system. Um, just a quick overview there and a little bit about the rest, how the rest of the farm works. We send the hoggets to the vineyards for 100 days over winter. So this um, gives time for the pasture to be spelt at that time. Our fertiliser program has changed. We've really focused on lime, guano, phosphate, sulphur, boron, and we don't apply any bag nitrogen. This is something Dave and I feel quite strongly about, probably following Derek's footsteps in terms of uh, sustainable farming. And we prefer to fix our nitrogen using legume. So there's a story there for you, Sam. <laughs> I know that's not easy for everybody to do, but something I would really consider looking at in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Big thing with the system is having the discipline to hold off raising that first green strike of clover. It's really hard, everything's brown. You use need feed at tupping, and at times you just have to, maybe in someone's situation, supplementary feed for two weeks, just to let it get going, or put another fence up for an area that you want to keep off. It's really, really worth doing. You've got to be disciplined on that. Um, and as David's mentioned, one of the advantages of the system is that our ewes are now weaning at target tupping weights. Don't want to baffle with you with lots of figures here, but um, if you look at the yellow one, average lamb weaning weight, 27 kilo lambs, really doesn't cut the mustard in the prime department. Um, we're now weaning at 35 kilos. The um, ewe tupping weight's gone from 63 kilos in 2001 up to 70 kilos, and it's set around that mark. Um, in our scanning, so these are from now straight corridors, pretty much probably 10% pole dorset influence in there, 178% from corries. Um, so that's pretty impressive for a corry. We think we, we like our corridors. We um, David really enjoys the wool, so that's something important to him. And um, one of the main benefits is we're actually getting a $25 difference in wool per head from a pole dorset corry versus a corridor. So um, we're just working on improving our corrid genetics. Our lambing percentage was 128, and we're around about that 135%, 138. Um, down at back a bit, our two tooths weren't so good. Last year we had a storm through and during the two tooth lambing. Um, growth rates, we have managed to crack 3743 145 grams per head per day, so that's average over everything. It's not at the bullshit end of the scale. We've oh, we get 450 grams per day. Well, that might be the top 10% of lambs that came off. So you're only kidding yourself if you do that. So be honest about your figures. Um, last year we delayed weaning because of prices. It was a really good season. We wanted lambs on mum, and kept them on, put more weight on. So the lamb growth rate average, of course, drops because you've got them on for longer. But general line is that lamb weight 
per U weaned per U weaned per kilo has gone up to 47 um, kgs, and our percentage prime at weaning is around 85 to 89 percent. Some people might say we've just got a low stocking rate. I suppose we have got a low stocking rate. We farm reasonably conservatively, but um, supplementary feed is really expensive. Um, we can use the cattle for that flexibility. Um, and just out of interest sake, over winter for 16 weeks, we do have around 11 stock units per hectare. So that's reasonably up there in that area. So just quickly over the whole area, just as comparison, um, when lamb was $4.40 per kilogram carcass weight, which I'm sure we can all remember, um, and $1.80 kilograms for store, we were $40,000 ahead just in three years, just from having those lambs at 7 kgs heavier at weaning. We've gone from 60 to 76 tonnes of meat in that per hectare in that 560 hectare area. It was interesting to hear what you were saying that you can grow half a tonne of meat over that spring area, so we're doing about 1.2, aren't we? Yeah, if my maths is right, yeah. Something else we're trying, Antas clover, which is a sub. So I've got some, got some here if anyone wants to come and have a look. It's quite stalky. This is, how old is it, Dave? Uh, that was sown uh, last week of March. Last week of March, and it'll probably, yeah, uh, I'll show you the next photo. It's Dave's favourite truck. Um, it, can, it gets really high and it's got a lot of leaf and stalk and it's a fantastic um, crop. We find um, we've drilled it initially. Uh, the next year we didn't get quite so much regrowth because it's um, quite hard seeded. It's much, sometimes in Australia it takes two years to seed, so every third year you'll see it again. But we have re-drilled it again and using it as a crop. So we're just going to play some drone footage just to show you the area of the farm that we've been talking about. And while we're doing that, I'm just going to um, ask Derek and Dave some tricky questions, which I'm sure you're all burning to ask, but I thought I'd choose them and make them answer them. So let me use that one. So um, probably a question for you, Dave. If I was thinking of doing this on my own farm, where, would, where should I put the fencing fences up first, north, south? Yeah. Aspects amazing. I mean, in our situation, we're lucky we've got a really good balance of northerly, southerly facing country, as you can see. So, our first step was to take the uh, north, uh, split those um, aspects in half. Okay. Um, I just don't have enough area on my farm to um, keep off the sub clover in autumn. What, you know, what am I going to do about that? It's a big uh, when we first took this on, it was a, it's a big mindset change. You've just got to be prepared to put the fences up, make sure the water supply is in. It's basic stuff, but it, um, having that flexibility by that extra sort of 60k of fencing that's there now has enabled us to carry stock far further into the drought. Um, I haven't fed out a bale of baleage to a ewe, even in the drier years. We've had uh, 2014, 2015 with very, very poor springs, yet we still managed to get through with the, with the extra fencing. It's made a hell of a difference. This might be one for Derek. Derek, do I really need legumes? Isn't grass oversown with, you know, or crops grown with nitrogen cheaper? Do I still need to answer that question, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, look, there's a couple of things to think about. It's 25 to 30 kgs of nitrogen per tonne of legume that you grow. That's what you're getting fixed for nothing from the atmosphere. With subterranean clover, um, in some of those pastures we're looking at, we're growing four tonne of legume, so we're getting 100 kilos of nitrogen into that system. It dies every year, so actually that nitrogen's becoming available for the grass. Um, grasses will grow, but the thing that limits grass production is nitrogen, and um, we can't get away from that fact. That's, that's biology. We can't change that biology. Nobody's yet been able to create a, le uh, a grass plant that fixes in, despite the claims when I was a young student that that was going to happen by now. No, it hasn't, and nitrogen is still the nutrient that limits. So, yep, we need legumes not just for the nitrogen, but also for the quality. So you, they will consume, animals will consume more by being able to eat that, that legume, and really important in that lactation phase. 
three minutes, okay. So um, just one last question there. Um, my cat will just get bloat and die on sub, won't they? <laughs> With the Santas here, you'll note, I don't know how many people have used it, but you'll see it's got quite a stalk to it. I mean, we've been using this for three years. We can get two kgs out of our two-year-olds two year a day on that stuff. I do not break feed them on it. They've got an ad lib and we have not lost one. And I put that down to that fibrous stalk. We do give them um, our straw, but generally speaking, they don't touch it too much. But it's that stalk and the base there that's, I think, counteracting any bloat problems. But the growth on this stuff is phenomenal. Any questions from the floor now? Uh, Dave, David or Derek, um, how about plant damage during grazing in the winter? So it's a rosette and those growing points have been pulled below ground. So you can graze it in the winter and it'll produce new leaves in the spring. So it, it actually handles that okay. Um, you can't really kill it in, from that winter grazing unless you're extremely severe on it. Before we um, graze it with the twins, uh, break feeding it through the winter, we'll dig down underneath that plant and you can have a look at the root preserves and make sure they're fibrous and right down and honestly we'll deck it. Um, mainly to get rid of the grass if there's any. This is, this is pretty typical. This was taken this morning with Jack Frost on it. But um, if you have a good look at that, the root mass of that sub is right in there. You can deck that and you can guarantee that the sward that comes back um, when the soil temperature hits that 10 degree mark in September, um, she'll just come rocketing through. Um, sure, you're going to get a wee bit of this weed called ryegrass, but this stuff also will just go for it. But it's all about that root mass underneath before you graze it. You've got to have those five, troliot, five trifoliates on the top, but a very deep root mass as well. Time for one more. Yeah, Mark. We'll make that the last question. Grab the microphone. Grab the microphone, please. Methods of establishment. Next one. Sorry. Methods of establishment on really steep country that you can't drill and uh, longevity. How long does it last? I'll answer it backwards, but it lasts forever, unlike some things. But. Um, <laughs> um, when you, we, this stuff was thrown, the seed was thrown out in the 70s and I can tell you without a word of a lie we haven't put any out of the aeroplane since. When I select that block in the spring, you'll see a plant here, plant over there, and maybe plant over there. If you manage it right, keep off it, that will go by about a metre. You know, one plant will, the runners will increase to a metre. It's incredible what it will do. But you've got to have the discipline to keep off it in that spring once, that, once the um, strip grazing's finished. We will have to bring it to a close because the other group's finished and we've run out of time. But um, I don't know if it's appropriate that we're giving honey that's after what you said about bees and sub not needing it and all the rest of it. But that's what you've got and it's Manuka honey. We could prattle on about Island Hills honey but he still hasn't turned up so we won't. Um, <laughs> I could also prattle on about the benefits of Corridales because that was fantastic to finally, <laughs> finally find a supporter at something like this. We're but <laughs> Yeah, no, we're not. We're just getting started again. <laughs> Fold of Lucerne and then back to Corridale, so we're doing all right. And Ram Harness is in the last session with Dean Hodgen, so it doesn't always need to be new and flesh. Anyway, thank you, Derek and Joe and David. That was fantastic.